Hello, my name is Grant Rodney. Um, I'm an anaesthetist living and working in Dundee in Scotland. For the next 10 minutes, I'm going to discuss neuromuscular blockade monitoring uh, and its key role for um, airway management. I, I'm afraid I'm one of those twitchers. Um, I'm also a member of the Working Party for the Association of Anaesthetist Standards of Monitoring um, with publications in 2015 and 2021 that I've been involved with. I have some uh, images and videos to display for which I've consent. And I'm also grateful to Fanon for the opportunity to speak on this topic uh, during the industry-sponsored uh, symposium of theirs. Uh, I don't take any payment or any other reward for this work or for any other equipment evaluation that, I've doing, that I do or have done. So residual paralysis is defined as a train of four ratio of less than 0.9. And according to the literature, this is very common. If we look at standard practice, with studies and meta-analyses, somewhere between 30 and 40% of our patients will fit into this category of having residual paralysis. This is with standard drug administration, non-quantitative monitoring, um, and largely the use of neostigmine to reverse. Indeed, if you measure this at extubation, some two-thirds of patients will fit into this category, and the recite studies repeated in Canada, in the US, um, and also in China, have shown exactly the same finding. And many will think that Sigamidex is the fix and the cure-all for this. In fact, a number of studies have shown that up to 10% of patients with the blind administration of Sigamidex will experience residual paralysis. I think this is a big unrecognized problem, and the iceberg analogy helps to sort of get our heads around this. Here we have a small tip of an iceberg, but actually for, for many anaesthetists, for many of us, uh, the iceberg is completely submerged. So we don't look for this as an issue. We don't see it, and therefore we don't believe that it is an issue. And numbers of surveys have shown this, in fact. Um, this one of European and American anaesthetists, two-thirds of those surveyed estimated the incidence of residual paralysis very much under 1%. Indeed, 80% claim never to have seen a significant case. So there's a, a fascinating dichotomy between the published evidence and what uh, anaesthetists may perceive in their clinical practice. So the standards of monitoring uh, just published uh, a couple of months back in the journal Anesthesia have been updated version 6 uh, for 2021. And then a, a number of key recommendations, and perhaps the most striking and the most leading, if you like, is this one, that quantitative neuromuscular monitoring should be used whenever we paralyze patients with neuromuscular blocking drugs. And ideally, we should use this throughout all phases from the start to the finish. And the key aspect is to ensure adequate recovery. And this is really a landmark statement um, as far as professional bodies around the globe go to actually be so explicit in saying that we should do this. I'd like to dwell on this slide for a minute or so. Um, which is important in relation to onset of block and paralysis and then recovery, with particular regard to the different muscle groups and their different sensitivities to the drugs that we use. So on the x-axis is the time elapsed since the administration of a neuromuscular blocking drug, and on the y-axis the percentage depression of a T1 single twitch, so the lower the percentage, the more paralysed. If we track the white and yellow lines representing the laryngeal muscles, the diaphragm, the upper abdominal muscles, indeed the corrugator supercilii, one of the eye muscles, we can see that there's a relatively rapid onset to these groups of muscles with a, with a, a generous blood supply. But the peak effect's limited and the recovery is rapid. And what this means, as we all know from our practice, is that there's a resistance to paralysis of these muscles. And we can attest to that when we intubate someone and they may cough or move or breathe. If we take point A, the black marker, where the train of four at the ulnar nerve is generating a response, we know that these muscles won't be paralyzed deeply. And indeed, even at point B, there may not be we may have a train of four count of zero and still have that movement and something that um, we don't always appreciate. But it's importance of monitoring and measuring that variability is in order to optimize airway management and to avoid airway trauma, not just, of course, with paralytic drugs, but also the hypnotics and opiates that we use. The red line representing the adductor pollicis 
uh, a muscle that recovers later and slower and is much more closely related to these muscles, which are absolutely key and fundamental for adequate recovery, and which is why that ratio for recovery, which used to be at 0.7, is now deemed to be 0.9, or perhaps it should in fact be even higher. So these key publications in relation to Airway NAP4 and the 2015 Difficult Airway Society guidelines they actually mention neuromuscular blockade as quite a key component um, throughout the publications in relation to normal airway practice to enhance and facilitate mask ventilation and intubation. And certainly when there is difficulty and absolutely certainly when front of neck uh, access is being contemplated. And the talk is a full neuromuscular block in inverted commas. And this can only be measured by actually quantifying that and measuring it to know what full actually means. So at the extubation recovery end, the impact of residual paralysis can be significant. And this will be completely unrecognized if we rely on clinical monitors or qualitative monitors. And I'll demonstrate that shortly in a video to determine adequacy of recovery. So at quite high levels of recovery, train of four ratios, for example, 0.7 to 0.8, there's an impaired inspiratory flow and there's an, an impact on respiratory reserve. The pharyngeal muscles and the genioglossal muscles are, are impacted. There's a reduction in tone and a reduction in air space with pharyngeal dysfunction and an aspiration risk that's increased um, at train of four ratios of 0.8 to 0.9. And this is particularly important in the more vulnerable patients we deal with. And indeed, even recovery to unity, a train of four of one, the forced vital capacity and the chemoreceptor mediated hypoxic ventilatory responses have not fully recovered. And that's at unity. And NAP5 and the risk of awareness is absolutely linked, as the author said, to neuromuscular blockade. And the worst outcomes are those with patients who are residually paralyzed on awakening. So key at this point is uh, the guaranteed measurement of adequacy of recovery. Um, and this needs to be measured and can only be done so by using a quantitative device before we awaken and extubate patients. The DAS extubation guideline highlights all the necessary measures needed and embedded within there is the statement to antagonize neuromuscular block. And this should, in my view, be accompanied by ensuring the train of four ratio is greater than 0.9. So this next little video sequence will just demonstrate the challenge we have and the reason that we need a quantitative device, because there's a gap essentially between 40 and 100% where we cannot distinguish fade. So this is measuring the ratio of the fourth to the first twitch. And I put it to you, those twitches are equal. Um, but in fact, the train of four ratio is 60%. So we can only plug that gap with certainty by measuring uh, the train of four ratio. So decades worth of publications have highlighted the issues, editorial comment, and I'd recommend this um, consensus statement published in 2018. The authors write a very reasonable piece which gives very good advice on how to implement this both personally and in departments um, because there is a challenge in doing so obviously but they recommend that quantitative neuromuscular block monitors should be used whenever we paralyze patients and in their view that ideal monitor should be an emg device so the the two groups um, of devices that are increasingly, and that's very reassuring for us as anaesthetists, are increasingly being made available by manufacturers, consist of acceleromography and electromography, AMG or EMG. So acceleromography requires the thumb to be moving freely. It's a mechanical response. It's Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. So if the thumb is, if the arms are tucked and the thumb can't move, there's also a phenomenon of, of earlier recovery ahead of the gold standard uh, and of reverse fade. So for many, electromography offers an alternative. It's measuring the electrical response, the muscle action potential, and is free of that arms tucked phenomenon. And there are a number of devices available, and they include this, the Twitch View. So the Twitch View is a, a very 
nice handy display with the train of four count and ratio or post titanic count indeed displayed on the right hand side there's a, a, a trend screen uh, and at the bottom the actual muscle action potential so that can be visualized and this has just been annotated with the muscle groups um, and the impact in terms of sensitivity or resistance that i discussed earlier i'm just going to run a very brief truncated sequence which will just highlight the application of the device, which is very simple, it takes 10 seconds. And then once the patient's anesthetized, there's a calibration process. Again, this takes 10 to 15 seconds to determine the optimal muscle response and then delivers a supramaximal stimulus and then displays the first of a train of four sequence, which then runs standard um, with a refractory time or period of induction of 20 seconds. So this is all speeded up now to show that onset of fade. In this particular patient, it took up to four minutes um, to reach paralysis in order to intubate. Here we can see the fade, the ratio reducing to a train of four count. And when that gets to zero, the device allows a post titanic count. And thereafter, it is completely automated the trend screen uh, is displayed. And at the end, again, we're fast tracking through this recovery spontaneously or with reversal drugs will get us to that 90% recovery point with certainty. In conclusion, residual paralysis is a real safety issue, but we have the potential to completely eliminate this by using quantitative monitoring. Such monitoring is endorsed by extensive evidence, by expert opinion, and also by professional society guidance, such as the association. Some experts feel that EMG monitoring is the gold standard. And this is fundamental and will enhance both routine anesthesia practice and airway management, not just by monitoring, but by employing a far reaching strategy, which is all around planning, paralytic drug use and appropriate reversal. I'd like to thank you very much for listening and also to thank my colleague Pavan Raju for his support with the video I displayed. Thank you.